you hear me? Good evening. Hi. Welcome to the uh, Alan Francis Hockland Memorial Lecture of the uh, Cary Institute for Government Reform. Uh, I'd like to open the proceedings. I'm Steve Greenwald by introducing our president, Richard Garassi. We'll say a few words. Thank you. I'll be short because I want to give maximum time to our speakers, but uh, thank you all for being here. The Cary Center is a special part of uh, Wagner College. We are dedicated to look at nonpartisan government reform. Uh, you all are growing up at a moment in uh, politics and government where there's lots of skepticism, lots of cynicism about the power of government, the effectiveness of government, the shallowness of political leadership and the like. So this center is really focused on what it would take to make government perform more effectively, more justly, um, more quickly. And how to do that in a way that brings more of you into the process so that we have a true democracy. So many of you are studying government or studying other subjects and involved in, in this process. I, I'm hoping that these kinds of talks stimulate you to the point where you want to know more and get involved at a greater level. I want to thank Steve Greenwald for running the Cary Center as our newest director. I want to thank Seymour Lachman, who's right over here. Seymour, stand up, please. He's our founder. benefactors with great families we've been supporting this work. So. Okay, I, will, I will let uh, Steve introduce uh, Susan and Dick and, and get out of the way. So thank you for all for being here. Thank you. Richard. And there's free pizza in the hawk's nest if you come to this event, right? No, I, I made that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you could say that. You could go there and tell them that. I said. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> yeah, tell them the president said. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you for coming. Um, if you read the newspapers, which I'm sure you do, religiously, uh, especially the New York Post, possibly, but also the New York Times, you know that uh, this is a, a fraught moment in uh, governance in New York State. Uh, there was two trials going on of uh, leaders of the legislature. Um, we called this uh, talk Albany's Year of Shame, because it has been uh, a remarkable year in that regard in the New York legislature, which is unfortunate. Uh, I saw in the New York Post yesterday a, a piece that a, uh, a good go a government organization that rates, an organization that rates governments in around the country in terms of uh, corruption uh, gave the uh, number one award this year to New York State, the most corrupt uh, state government in the United States. So there's a lot to discuss and we have two true experts here with us um, who have graced uh, this podium before, but I thank them both for being with us tonight. Uh, Susan Lerner, who's the Executive Director of Common Cause, and if you all pick up these brochures, you will have the bios for Susan and our other speaker is Dick Dady, who is the Executive Director of Citizens Union. Dick and Susan are right here. Um, Susan will speak first on uh, uh, campaign finance uh, in New York, and then Dick will speak about ethics. Uh, we know uh, we have a time limit of about six o'clock for most of you, so uh, they will speak uh, in a way, uh, over, uh, keep it relatively short, so we have time for a discussion to follow a Q&A. So I thank them both for being here, and with that, I'll ask Susan to come up and speak with you. Thank you, Susan. Thanks so much, and thanks to President uh, and to the Cary Institute uh, for having me here tonight. Uh, it's a very provocative title, Albany's Year of Shame, What Did We Learn and Where Do We Go? Um, well, one thing I think that we've learned is that there is definitely a problem with our state government. Uh, but the real question is, what should our attitude about that be? Uh, and how did we get here, and what can we do about it? I think we got here over a long period of time the culture of uh, corruption and entitlement, and therefore there is no one silver bullet as to where we should go, no easy solution. But we believe at Common Cause New York and uh, our good government colleagues, Citizen Union and others, uh, believe that there really are two sides to this equation. Um, because really, when you think about it, many of these problems arise from the 
corrosive impact of large money in politics. And the two halves of the solutions that we advocate for are campaign finance and ethics reform. So I'm going to talk about campaign finance reform. Dick is going to talk about ethics, as uh, Stephen said. Um, and what I'd like to do is to first start to talk a little bit about the problem. Um, and uh, let's see, I need to get to the browser, so give me a second here. And um, first, you know, just, just a tiny bit about Common Cause. We are part of Common Cause. New York is part of a national organization. We have um, a presence in over 30 states. We have paid staff in 22. We were founded in the early 70s by a Republican member of Lyndon Johnson's cabinet. Um, and we pride ourselves on our nonpartisan approach to the challenges that our democracy faces. Um, and we work both at the national and the state level to have a fully featured, functioning, effective democracy. And sometimes that's challenging, as we see right now in New York. Um, so when we talk about the problem of money in politics in New York, the problem is, is really uh, extensive. Before I get to the um, charts that I have here, I want to just point out that the most recent campaign filings uh, indicated that our governor, Governor Cuomo, raised over $5 million in the first six months of July 2015. Um, he has almost $13 million on hand in his campaign account as of uh, July of 2015. In that six month period, 84 donations um, came, uh, were made that were at least $20,000 or larger. Many of them were quite larger. And of, uh, and of those 84 donations, they totaled $2.6 million coming from 84 individuals, or 84 donations. Of 1.4 million of those donations came from limited liability companies, which are a special entity uh, that are created for very solid business reasons, but because of an oddity in the way in which our Board of Elections interprets our campaign finance laws, instead of being treated as corporations, they're treated as individuals. And instead of being subject to a $5,000 contribution limit on an annual basis, they are allowed to contribute uh, up to $160,000. Many of them do. Um, companies which exist, LLCs which exist for good business reasons, are then used to funnel a huge amount of money uh, into the campaign coffers, primarily of the governor and the legislative leaders of both houses of the uh, legislature. Democrats in the Assembly, the uh, Republicans in the Senate. But they're not the only uh, recipients. Um, what we see is large amounts of money which cluster around specific issues. And just this past June at Common Cause, we released a report we call Polishing the Apple, talking about the huge amount of political spending which was surrounding education issues here in our state. Um, and where previously the campaign and political spending, when I say political spending, I also include money spent lobbying and money spent advertising to all of you. And I'm sure you, there are some of you in this room who saw TV ads uh, accusing different assembly members of not wanting to help school children uh, and other ads pushing back, saying that the governor should be trusting teachers. All of those ads are marvelously expensive, and they really run up the political spending figures. So in our report, we looked at the period from 2005 to 2014. We found that the unions spent uh, over $200 million during that time period. Um, but the, uh, they were quickly matched at the end of the process, but not at the beginning, by the uh, contributors that we in our report call, let's see if I can get this to go down, the privatizers, people who uh, are in favor of charter schools and money for private schools. Uh, and those contributors pay close to a uh, million dollars. The two uh, spend their money very differently. 
The privatizers tend to contribute directly to politicians. The unions tend to spend money on PACs, which uh, are mobilizing large numbers of voters. What's really interesting about how that political spending is going is this particular chart, which shows you that uh, originally, from the beginning, the unions are spending at a pretty high level. But the red line, which indicates the privatizer forces, uh, all of a sudden, in 2000, what are we talking here, 2012, there's a tremendous escalation in the amount of money. And we actually had one organization, <laughs> one advocacy organization, which spent close to $10 million in a two-month period in 2014 advocating around education issues. Um, so this definitely creates a pay-to-play atmosphere and it makes ordinary, everyday New Yorkers feel like their voices are not being heard. But this is the problem. But there are solutions. The thing that's most important to remember is that we can address this problem. We can grab a hold of it and we can make a difference. We have examples throughout the country and also here in New York City. And the solutions are, again, somewhat varied. What we need to have is real campaign finance reform here in New York. We need to bring down campaign contribution limits so that you don't have a chart that shows 10, 20, 30 million dollars being aggregated by a particular politician. And we can do that. Many states have very reasonable campaign contribution limits. Congress does. At the federal level, the contribution limit is slightly more than $2,000. Here in New York State, if you decide that you want to write a maximum check to support the governor, it's over $60,000. And of course, if you have 40 or 50 LLCs at your command, you can, in the aggregate, end up contributing over a million dollars to the governor, as a uh, particular real estate company did uh, in 2014. But we don't have to accept this. This is not the way things should be. And it's up to us to demand changes. The changes that we need to demand are lowering, lowering the campaign contribution limits and setting up a system of public financing of elections, similar to the one, one way to do that would be to set up a system similar to the one we have in New York City, where you have a matching fund for small dollar contributions. Why would that make a difference? One of the big problems that we have with our elections is that people feel it's not worth getting engaged. People look at these huge checks that are being written by unions, by individual contributors, by business interests, and they say, why should I contribute? My 25 or $50 isn't going to mean anything. That's not the case here in New York City. Here in New York City, where every dollar that you <coughs> contribute to a city candidate is matched six to one, we see a much higher level of individuals contributing to city candidates than we do in similar locations for people running for the assembly, for instance. In a study that was done uh, looking at the 2013 campaign contributions, what we found is that even in low-income areas like Harlem or Bedford-Stuyvesant or Chinatown, People, individuals, were contributing between 19 and 20 times more to city candidates than they were to people running for the assembly in the same districts. That's because of the matching funds. Because having the matching funds changes the way candidates are campaigning. So that they're reaching out to individuals, they're emphasizing actual discussions and contact <coughs> with constituents, not just wealthy individuals. Now the city plan also has a very good feature, which limits campaign contributions by entities and individuals who are doing business with the city. So it emphasizes a person-to-person -person relationship between the voter and who can be a campaign contributor and the candidate. It changes the culture of campaigning. And we see that in other places that have uh, campaign finance and public financing. Connecticut has a public financing plan. It's somewhat different, but similar to the New York City plan. And just 
uh, this past election here in November 2015, we had two significant victories for public financing of elections at the ballot box. Maine has a long-standing public financing program, but because of Supreme Court decisions, parts of it were weakened. So citizens got together and they petitioned and they gathered signatures and they put a corrective measure on the ballot that was on the ballot on November 3rd and they fixed the weaknesses that had been created in the public financing program in Maine with 55 to 45 percent. 55% of Mainers understood how important the public financing was to their political culture in Maine and they voted to fix it. Seattle has a different approach. Uh, on November 3rd, there was a measure on the ballot, again, citizen initiated, that set up a voucher system. It's not the same system that we have here in New York City with a matching fund. It sets up a system where every single registered voter has the right to receive four $25 vouchers. But the vouchers are only good if you deliver the voucher to the candidate of your choice who is running in Seattle. And that idea was so popular that it won with 30% of the voters. Polling across the country shows that people are fed up with the huge amount of money which is pouring into our elections and they are looking for and at solutions. And the idea of lowering limits, the idea of closing loopholes, remember I talked about the LLCs have the special advantage. We could, the legislature could close that. The Board of Elections could close that. They created the problem. But they feel that they can get away with it because they feel the public doesn't care. I don't think the public doesn't care. I think the public has gotten discouraged. And what we need to remember is that these are elected officials who are supposed to be working and are working for us. So we need to give them clearer instructions. We need to look at the examples in New York City. We need to look at the recent wins in Maine and in Seattle. And we need to say to our elected representatives, the governor, the leaders of the legislature, and everybody's individual assembly member and senator, and say, you can do better. We can get you out of the money swamp with some fairly common sense, straightforward solutions. So lower the campaign contributions, close the LLC loopholes, clean up what you can spend your campaign dollars for? Should we really be encouraging uh, legislators to be leasing cars with campaign dollars or taking expensive trips? That's not why we give them campaign money. As voters, we want them to use it communicating with voters. So we need to clean that up. And we need to have a workable, solid public financing system here, like we do in New York City, we need it for Albany. We need to cut the connection between the large money contributions and the public policy, that pay-to-play atmosphere. And we know from examples in other states that we can do it. It's up to us as voters, as citizens, as engaged <coughs> residents of New York State to tell our elected representatives, there's a better way. We're going to help you figure it out when we ask you to actually get behind the change. So thank you. Do you want me to go? Yeah. Okay. Dictating. And then we'll do a Q&A after the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Well, it's going to be tough to follow on Susan's very informative uh, discussion around campaign finance reform, but uh, I'll try. Um, you know that um, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm the executive director of Citizens Union, which is a, a historic government group that has been around for 118 years. Uh, we were formed uh, when Tammany Hall was in control of the city's politics. How many of you know about Tammany Hall? Come on. And maybe uh, a sprinkling. Uh, more of you don't know about Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall was the uh, term of art used to describe corrupt New York City politics at the turn of the 20th century, and really in the last half of the 1800s. Uh, it was uh, a, a, a term to describe the Democratic Party and the way at which it operated uh, out of its headquarters called Tammany Hall. Um, 
Citizens Union was founded in 1897 to prevent the expansion of corruption into what had just become the greater city of New York that took in the cities of Brooklyn and the, cities of, and the city of Queens. And Citizens Union was uh, uh, a, a, founded as a political party. And in 1901, it helped elect the first reform mayor of the city of New York, Seth Lowe, who happened to also be the mayor of Brooklyn. Can people hear me? I just want to be sure that, okay. Uh, because some of you are starting to doze off out there. And I, I, I don't know if it's me or is it the room, so I'm, I'm glad to know that you're still with me. Maybe I'll speak into the, in the microphone a little louder. Anyway, so Citizen Union, as I said, started as a political party. And uh, after having uh, uh, elected Seth Lowe, it then, two years later, had Seth Lowe defeated. Tammany Hall figured out how to take back power in the city. And uh, Citizens Union transformed itself into a civic association. Uh, I have some information here um, about Citizen Union that I just want to share with you. So if you'll give me a minute. Um, and so we, you know, uh, we have been around for 118 years. And our, our primary cause today uh, in fighting for political reform and fighting for good government, uh, we describe it as making democracy work for all New Yorkers, trying to make our political processes more responsive to the citizens of, of New York and to all residents, also to ensure that our elected officials are held accountable for their, their promises that they make during the campaigns, um, and you know, uh, really uh, uh, try and fight for the kind of political reform that has resulted in greater citizen participation and ownership of our democracy. A hundred years ago today, uh, not a hundred years ago today, but a hundred years, years ago this year, uh, Citizens Union had one of its early victories, and that was the abolition of slate voting. Uh, so now, some of you uh, probably have only voted on the scanning machines. Have you ever voted on those old lever machines? You know, you know what we're talking about? Well, these guys over here, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but the old lever machines, right? Maybe, you, maybe your parents took you in, if you're from New York, where you come in, you know, and you like, take that big old lever and move it over and you hear, <laughs> right? All the um, votes being cast. Well, there was a time in the late 1800s and the 1900s when those very same machines were being used that you would go in, if you wanted to vote for President of the United States, and he happened to be a Republican, you'd hit that lever, and then all the Republican levers for all the other offices would be turned down. You could only vote for the party and not for the individual. And in 1915, Citizens Union, in one of his early victories, was able to abolish slate voting, so you could go in and not vote for the party, but for the individual. Um, if you go to onto our website, citizensunion.org, you will see a number of these materials that I'm sharing you with right now, our mission, our aims and our values, which are very similar to Common Cause. Common Cause and Citizens Union work in um, many collaborative ways. Uh, Susan's organization is national uh, with a state focus. Citizens Union is really focused on the five boroughs and how the city affects uh, New York City, but also how the state affects uh, this, uh, the city of New York. Our values are articulated here. I'm not gonna go into all this because what I'm really here to talk with you about uh, is uh, about ethics reform. And Citizens Union also publishes Gotham Gazette. If you don't subscribe to Gotham Gazette, I urge you to do so. It's our daily news online publication. Um, just go to gothamgazette.com, sign up to get the morning eye opener. It brings together all the local daily news that you wanna know in terms of politics and reform, and also uh, provides original reporting. gothamgazette.com. And then here's an articulation of our uh, issues and our positions, the range of uh, issues that we work on, both at the New York City level and the New York State level, budget reform, election reform, judicial reform. You know, on the state level, it's uh, 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 redistricting reform, also city council reform, et cetera, et cetera. It all has to do with reforming our, our city and state government, uh, which, as we know, in New York State, actually, in, in Albany, uh, it's dysfunctional and it is, it is broken. But, uh, what we really want to talk, Susan and I, about today is to try and give you not only background, but to really encourage you to engage, not just to be informed, but to really get engaged and to take ownership of the democracy of which we are, we are all a part. Uh, today, Susan and I uh, happen to be in Foley Square uh, holding a news conference uh, to call out the governor and the New York State Legislature to return to Albany next month in special session. They only meet from January through June. To return next month, before the new year, in special session to deal with ethics reform. There have been changes, there have been improvements, and there have been reforms over the last 10 years, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But we have a long ways to go, and so Susan and Common Cause and others, uh, along with Citizens Union today, called upon the governor and the legislature to complete the job, to finish the task, 
because there's a lot still left on that table in spite of the recent improvements that we have made. And how big of a problem is corruption in New York State? Well, let's go to Citizens Union's corruption tracker, if you don't mind. Okay? Uh, it's a horrible website. We're actually rebranding the organization. Uh, so we'll have a brand new website come, come March. And so if you go into the website now, please do not hold it against us. It's a free website that was given to us by one of our donors 10 years ago. Anyway, so this is Citizens Union's corruption tracker. And this shows the crime wave, the actual crime wave that is happening in Albany uh, as the number of state legislators who have left office because of criminal or misconduct or ethical issues, we call it corruption. It's corruption in, in many different ways. And you can see, if you go down here, uh, you know, in from 1990, it's over the past 15 years. 1999, it was three, and then it, you know, uh, goes to five, and then it goes to uh, well, here's five, and then it goes to, uh, what is this? I don't know if I can only figure out how to work this, but anyway. You can see these, uh, these semicircles, how this one gets particularly large, uh, the, one, the session that just ended. Um, so since 2000, 31 state legislators have left office due to criminal or ethical issues. 31 state legislators in the last 15 years, with an additional two now facing trial, and uh, involve former Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, as well as a former Senate Majority Leader, Dean Skelis. Um, and if they are convicted, uh, it'll soon climb to 33. Um, I like those little pieces of art, you know, kicking that bag of money under the table. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's our way of uh, demonstrating uh, what this is about. Look, if, you want it, if you go under our website, you can see this corruption tracker. Um, but here is a, uh, uh, a list of all the people who uh, <coughs> Here, here's a chart that shows the crime wave, right? It kind of dips up and, and dipped up significantly in 2013, 2014, in the legislative session that just ended uh, at the end of December 13. And already, uh, six months into the, into the, into the two-year cycle, we've had three convictions and two more on dock. So we actually are on track, uh, if this happens, to have five in the first year. Uh, and if that uh, trend continues, we may hit 10 which would be the high water mark uh, and just shows the level of corruption that goes on in here in New York State. But all is not to be you know, lost on this. Why is this happening? Well, I would argue, and Citizens Union would argue, and this is a list of all the people if you ever want, you know, if you really want to get down into the nitty gritty weeds. Um, and these are a list of all the legislators since 1999 who have left uh, state office because of misconduct and the reasons uh, behind them. Um, but going back up uh, here, yes? For the students say, give them one concrete example from that list to show what kind of corruption exists, what sure. the forms of it, what was gained. Well, well I'll just, uh, you know, uh, this may not be proved to be illegal, right. or illegal, I should say, but let's just take what's in the news today. I mean, how many are you familiar with the trial of Shelley Silver? No? You know who Shelley Silver is? Okay, Shelley Silver is the former speaker of the New York State Assembly. He had been in office, he's been a member of the Assembly representing the Lower East Side since 1972 or 1974. He's been speaker of the New York State Assembly since 1992 or 93. Longest, almost the longest serving speaker of the New York State Assembly. He has been charged, he was, he was arrested in January of this year and now he's standing trial in the federal courthouse for Two things. One, essentially chain, uh, uh, using his post for private gain, using his public post for private gain. What does that mean? He would essentially refer clients from a cancer center at Presbyterian Hospital who were suffering and who, whose illness was connected to uh, asbestos. And there was some, and he referred <coughs> patients of a friend of his to this law firm of which he was of counsel. And the law firm would then file suit against those who had the asbestos and win claims for these victims. Shelley Silver would get a referral fee. Did no work, just simply did a referral fee by recommending that these clients of this hospital go to this law firm that he's of counsel and get a lawsuit filed. In return, Shelley Silver gave a half a million dollars. Why? allegedly, okay, gave a half a million dollars to this cancer center at Presbyterian. From state funds. From state funds. 
Thank you very much. This is why these guys are the professors, and you know, I'm the advocate. I just get all excited about this, and maybe not necessarily pay as close attention to the facts as I should. But so he used his public post and access to state funds to give five hundred thousand dollars to this cancer center, and the guy who ran the cancer center then used then then sent patients over to the law firm that Shelley Silver was of counsel that then Shelley Silver got referral fees. That is abject corruption. Whether it rises to the point of whether it is illegal is something that the courts, or the jury, will be deciding over the next month. But that's a classic example, and the most recent example that is in the news. Google it, Shelly Silver, and you'll be brought up to speed. So, um, let's see here, I want to go back. So, um, what, why are we seeing this crime wave um, of corruption? Well, I would argue that um, we're seeing it in part because of the uh, progress we've actually made in strengthening our ethics laws. Um, you know, for the past 10 years, beginning with Governor Elliot Spitzer, yeah, he issued an executive order for ethics reform about banning uh, state employees from accepting gifts. Um, and he used many of the things that he outlined in his uh, executive order and it made them part of a law three months later that became known as the Pira Law of 2007. Um, but the problem with that is this, the continued self-dealing and self-policing. Ethics oversight and enforcement of the state legislature was done by whom? The state legislature. Ethics oversight and enforcement of the executive branch was done by the executive branch. So there was no independence in terms of the ability to root out corruption and misconduct because it was, they were watching each other. They had each other's backs. They were not gonna go hard on themselves because they had permissive rules. And so even though there were some significant changes here like increased reporting requirements for lobbyists and, and, and conducting a two-year post-employment ban on lobbying for state and legislative employees, there still was this bifurcated system of where each branch of government essentially set up an enforcement unit to look after itself. There was no independence whatsoever. <coughs> Um, one of the significant things, we look back at it now and you know, we kind of forget about how significant it was at the time, but there used to be people who were worked for state government who would retire or resign and then turn around and join a lobbying firm that would be retained by clients that would be trying to influence the agency or the uh, legislature on the very issues that they worked on. And it was insider dealing, essentially. You know former employees of our state government turning around and making money as a result of their knowledge and contacts and being retained by these lobbying firms and then recruiting clients to help them with the very issues that they are familiar with. Um, Governor Cuomo gets elected in 2010, 2011. We have the Reform Act uh, called PIRA, uh, and it created for the first time joint oversight of the executive and the legislative branches. That was a very difficult thing to achieve. The problem was, is that even though there was finally some independence and there were some checks and balances between each of the two branches looking over one another, there still was some bizarre voting rules. It's a 14-member commission, 14 members, some appointed by the governor, a majority appointed by the governor, I believe, uh, and not, I don't know, not a majority appointed by, I can't remember, but anyways, it's like split between the governor and the legislature. legislature. 14 members. If there were three votes, Let's say there's a, a vote to proceed with an investigation or to pursue a case. If there were three votes from the same party in the same uh, house of the legislature voting against an investigation, three of those 14, and there were the, another 11 saying proceed with the investigation, the investigation stopped, it was blocked. Three members of the commission could block an investigation from going forward if they were of the same party and from the same house within that legislative branch. That was one of the very uh, weaknesses in this law, even though we now have joint oversight. You can see here, and then in April 2014, a little over a year ago, there were some other elements uh, to the public. Uh, you know, as we strengthened ethics again in 2014, we strengthened it again in 2015. So there have been five efforts over the last 10 years that have essentially strengthened ethics oversight and enforcement within New York State. And with each bite of the apple, we've gotten better at it. And I believe that it's a result of this increased disclosure, this increased strength of the watchdogs, that has ferreted out the kind of corruption that has operated underneath the surface for so long. And that's why we're seeing this crime wave. 
because we now have access to information that previously was hidden from view. And so I believe that even though we're in a golden time of corruption, if you want to call it that, we will soon begin to turn around and see a much better state government as a result of ferreting out all this bad activity because of these stronger laws. But because we have stronger laws does not mean that we've solved it. We're far from solving it, which is why Susan Common Cause and Reinvent Albany and some of the other good government groups today called upon the legislature and the governor to return to Albany to finish the job. And what do we mean by finishing the job? So the primary ask, there are five asks that we've got. The primary ask is that we need to end the practice of having these legislators, just like Shelley, Shelley Silver, use their uh, public posts for private gain. What does that mean? They use their power to earn outside income, a separate and apart from the legislature, and unlimited amounts of money, representing people who do business before the state. What we suggest is that restrict the amount of money that legislators can earn in outside income, raise their salary, and ban Lulu's, and uh, overhaul their pre travel reimbursements. If we end up paying them more, they're only paid $70,500 right now. That seems like a lot of money, uh, but they can make a lot of money as a result of their outside contacts. We want to limit what they can earn outside, raise their base pay, and reform the whole compensation system so that the temptation for corruption is not as great as it is now. Thank now, you. explain Lulu. So Lulu uh, is a uh, payment in lieu of something, right? And so what they uh, are getting is for uh, committee, being a committee chair, because it involves so much more work, right? Um, or a leadership position, they get 10, 15, 25,000 dollars more as a result of being a committee chair or a leader within the assembly. You know how many leadership there positions there are in the state assembly? There are 150 members. I think there's like 30. 30, there's the deputy leader for this, assistant leader for that. All, they don't have any responsibilities. They don't have, they've just got titles. And with the titles come the $25,000 stipend, or what we call Lulu. All right? Does that answer the question? Yes. So, reform legislative compensation. The other thing is to limit the influence of dark money campaign contributions and end government spending that takes place in the shadows. Susan talked very well about the LLC loophole and about requiring campaign contributors to disclose their employers, which is something that is currently not required. And then we are pushing very strongly that there's, there are these things in the budget, state budget, it's what, a $140 billion budget. You have pots of money in the budget that say $200 million for labor initiatives or $200 million for private economic development initiatives to be decided by the Senate majority or the Assembly majority. That's all that is said, right? And what happens is that after the budget is approved, the leaders get together and decide how that money is spent, and there's no transparency. And so we want to end that because that's a lot of where a lot of the corruption takes place are in these lump sum appropriation funds. Uh, we also want to get rid of um, use of their campaign funds. This is legalized extortion. And I, I want to really emphasize this. We have one of the most uh, non-competitive uh, races. All the, uh, our, our, legislative, our contests for legislative races are among the most non-competitive in the country. Re-election rate of uh, state lawmakers is 98%. If you're incumbent, you've got a 98% chance of being reelected. And many, as a result of that, many people don't challenge the state lawmakers. And so what happens is lawmakers get reelected and reelected with no challenge at all during the November general election. But they still go out and raise campaign money. They still go out and they hold their fundraisers in Albany and they collect big campaign contribution checks from the lobbyists that they meet with earlier in the day to talk about legislative business and then they do their political business within a half mile of the Capitol and they raise tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal campaign contributions along the lines of what Susan talked about. And then they use those campaign funds not on the campaigns against these challengers who are not challenging them because they don't exist, but rather on things that, like dinners, like suits. You know, if I'm gonna appear on TV as an elected <laughs> official, I think I gotta go out and get a new suit, right? Perfectly allowable. If, you know, all these people who I want to let them know that I care about their wives and their families and their graduations, I will send them flowers. I won't pay for them. My campaign account will pay for them. There's too much campaign, too much of these campaign funds are used for personal use, and so we want to ban that as well. Just let me move this quickly along because then we can ask questions. 
Um, the other, the other uh, three things are reforming ethics, oversight, and enforcement by changing Jacob's structure. This goes to this idea of where three people out of 14 can block an investigation from going forward. But there's a lot of other uh, permeation, uh, permutations of this uh, Jacob, which is the Joint Commission on Public Ethics, which is the joint oversight body of the legislative and the executive branch. So there are some of the points there. And then the last two are strengthening the financial disclosure requirements for all public officers, including state legislators and uh, elected officials, as well as streamlining and standardizing the disclosure of lobbying activity. New York State is a big, big business for lobbying. Big, big, big. Um, what's this, maybe $150 million or more? Or, or more. Or more, yeah, $150 million is spent by lobbyists trying to influence the decisions of state government. Now listen, our right to lobby our state our government is a constitutionally protected right. Uh, the right to retain professional assistance is fine. It's just that it's become a huge industry. <coughs> but we need to know what's going on. And we don't really, even though they have strengthened it and there's greater disclosure, and, but it's so difficult to try and summarize. And so if I'm a lobbyist and I'm working on public education, and I have to say, you know, I've got three clients that I'm working on public education. Subject matter to be identified. Public education, education of our children, higher education, elementary education. There's no standardization of the categories that lobbyists should use in reporting their activity. So they can make up whatever phrase they want to describe the issues or subjects they're working on. And can you imagine Susan and I trying to sit down and try and figure out how much money is being spent to influence our public education system in New York State? We can't do it because there's no standardization. So in order for us to get a better handle on the kind of lobbying activity and where influence is happening, we need standardization and streamlining of this lobbying activity. So that's... Uh, those five big things in a culture of corruption in Albany where we have had 31 legislators leave office as a result of misconduct, we hope that by you know, tightening the screw, strengthening oversight, and increasing enforcement, will we finally begin to see the kind of corruption and the crime wave that we've seen drop in New York State. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Uh, we're going to open, open it up for questions. Uh, Should we stand up? Yeah, yeah come on. <laughs> so I have one question. Uh, start us off. You know, when we hear what you're saying, it's so, it seems so clear and so logical. And the problems, you know, seem so uh, severe. Uh, well, just take the one example of this uh, 14 person. <coughs> investigating group and some and only three people out of the 14 you don't have to be a math whiz to figure out that that's less than a majority can stop an investigation who de who the hell defends these kinds of things on what basis do they defend the, oh. that sort of policy what is the rationale i'd like to know yeah. the, so rationale the rationale for these nutty policies so the rationale for that one is that the legislative leaders say that the Commission could go on witch hunts and blacken the names of different legislators for no good reason, and that therefore there has to be a check on the ability of the commission to unfairly investigate people. But that's not really an answer. But that's, that's why we're trying that, to be. That's, that's the answer. That's the answer. That's no. what they say. And when and Susan and I were both involved in the negotiations no. of this bill. And it got worse and worse and worse over the course of like 12 hours. We just saw this thing go south. But what we both, you know, we both signed on in support. We held our nose and did this. You guys did, right? Yeah. But we did that because we thought, some, even though this was a this voting thing was outrageous, it was the first time that we were going to get joint oversight of the executive and legislative branch, branches, and it was the price of admission that we had to pay in order okay. to get that. And now we're going to correct the problem. Okay. Well, I'll open it up now to. Uh, questions from the audience. You must have some questions about what you've heard. Is it okay with you that all these people are going to jail? How many people are in favor of corruption? Why is corruption bad? Uh, oh, I was just saying, I was going to yeah, ask yeah. a question. Okay. Can I ask a question? Uh, this has to do with campaign finance. Uh, do you think the growing uh, wealth gap between the uh, rich and the poor has led to legislation that um, has skewed this campaign finance, or it's more just a cultural thing? No, I, I think you're on the wrong for chicken and egg. 
problem, okay? So what we've seen, and there are various studies, particularly at the national level, which show that as campaign <coughs> contributions have risen from specific industries and specific special interests, the public policy has begun to follow the desires of those contributors. Um, and the public policies then exacerbate the income inequality. So that it's a vicious cycle that we're seeing and that it, one of the ways in which it really needs to be broken is controlling the money in politics so that uh, the policies which our elected leaders feel that they have to enact are the policies that benefit all of us and not the policies who are benefiting the large campaign contributors. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, if, if you give $10,000, let's say, to Governor Cuomo, uh, or $50,000 to Governor Cuomo, um, and your neighbor gives him $10, and you both call his office on the same day, who do you think's call is gonna get returned quicker? And who do you think's gonna maybe get an audience? Or who's gonna be listened to a little bit more? Sadly, the person who made the large contribution. Uh, that will buy you access. It may not necessarily influence the ultimate decision, but it'll give you an audience and allow you access uh, over and above average citizens. And as Susan has said, that has led to you know, this warped uh, 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 level of attention being paid to those who have money. So the analysis that has been done recently by different academics show that, it, and there are many issues which poll with great popularity across the political spectrum, <coughs> and yet those issues are not being addressed in Congress or in the state legislature. What is being addressed are the concerns of the wealthy contributors who are concerned about taxes on uh, income from investments, um, industries that are concerned about tax breaks that they want to preserve even though they are marvelously profitable, and a long host of things in a Congress that cannot address the, the incredible deterioration of our infrastructure across the country, can't address the crisis we have in immigration, is willing to sell out to the big banks to uh, continue to allow for really large interest increases and horrible default provisions on student loans, to pick an example where the financial industry has really run roughshod over the desires of the vast majority of Americans. Um, and the list goes on and on. So, it, and the net impact, as I said, is to cause people to feel disaffected from their government. But the only thing that is really going to respond and push back on organized money, which is what we're seeing right now, is organized people. Right, and yeah, This is for each of you. Um, if you could institute one and only one reform in each of your areas, which would it be? Well, we talk about a comprehensive package of campaign right. finance reform. And you that's what I institute. You're going to get one. Um, I could get one. That's an impossible question. Um, where would I start? What? I would start with public finance and elections. That's where I would start. Because while it might not um, control all of the political spending, what it does do is that it encourages more people to get involved and it encourages more people to run. And what we need over time, frankly, is to bring in more people who haven't grown up politically in this system and feel entitled and feel and don't have enough imagination to think of some other way to do it. Would you therefore limit the total amount that could be spent by a campaign in an election? You can't. Well, only in public. Only, only with public funding. Well, you just said you want the public funding. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But those who, yes. you, if those, that still you, 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 you still, yeah. those who would, who would still be allowed to raise private contributions, right, or use their own money. No, you right. can't opt out. You yeah. can't opt out. Oh, yeah, but you, no, I mean, that's, I don't know. you're making the law. No, that's no but the U.S. Supreme, I would make public financing mandatory, and I would do full public financing, but, the U.S. Supreme Court, in its wisdom, has said you cannot make public <coughs> financing mandatory. And the full public financing systems have been so undercut by the Supreme Court that they're not workable. So what we have is a voluntary system 
of public matching funds where we, the public, says to the candidates, do you want to work for us or do you want to work for the special interests? And the smart candidates want to work for us and they take public money. And for, for me, I would basically uh, limit to 20% uh, of what they can earn outside uh, as lawyers, as bankers, as teachers, whatever and raise their pay significantly. I would pay state lawmakers $150,000, get rid of the committee stipends, and allow them to earn no more than 20% of that. Would you make them full-time? Which would make them full-time. I would. Bill, and then Jeff. Uh, there was just a district attorney's race here in Richmond County, also known as Staten Island. Let's assume that every student here is a voter. Let's assume that they take your message seriously. They really want to make intelligent decisions. Is there a simply available place where they can get the list of every single contributor to each of those DA candidates? Who gave the money and how much without having to run a gauntlet to get the information? Yes. Readily available? Yes. The Board, Board, of, Board, where that Board of Elections. Board of Elections State website. Board of Elections State. website. Do they have to make a freedom of information? No, no, no. it's on the web. You got on the website. You can get anybody's contribution yeah. for the last 20 years. Right. Good and morning. you'd be surprised you'd find, find, out out find your contributions made in your name that you had no idea. So there's, I, I know it's difficult to get uh, reforms through the uh, legislature, which is corrupt. That's part of the problem. But there is a constitutional convention that's possible starting the year 2017. Uh, are you in favor of a constitutional convention? And if so, uh, what uh, package of reforms would you have the Constitution Convention adopt? So Common Cause has not yet taken a position. So um, I will answer that, but as you guys leave, I just want to yeah, encourage you, do not, be, have classes, ah, so. do not be discouraged yeah. <laughs> by some of the underbelly of the message that Susan and I are delivering. Uh, as Susan says, uh, the way we beat the system that we are talking about is to organize people. Voter participation in this, in this city and this state is horrible. We need to boost voter participation. New York State ranks 49th out of 51 states, including the District of Columbia, in terms of voter turnout. The only way that we can ultimately solve these problems that we're talking about is for people to get out and vote, for people to get off the sidelines and get involved in campaigns, making contributions, and regist registering, and then voting. And running. And running. And running. And running. Right. Public run finance election will let you election run. on Sunday. Well, get out there and run. If, if, you, if you find this interesting, you should definitely subscribe to Gotham Gazette, which I subscribe to. It's a lot of really interesting information. And there's also a Common Cause email list where we talk about the issues we're working on at the city and the state level. It's New York specific. And you, so can, go to, and you can go to Citizen Union's website and do the same. To answer your question, and, and what happens, we do not have voter initiative referendums like they do in California and many other states. Uh, the only way in which citizens can actually participate in changing state government significantly is to vote on referendums that are put forward by the state legislature, which rarely happens, or answer positively to a question that happens, that is required to happen every 20 years, is should New York State hold a constitutional convention? The last time that that happened by the voters was 1937. The question is coming up again in 2017. In 1997, when the question was last asked, Citizen Union supported the call for a constitutional convention, even though we had concerns about the way in which the delegates were selected. We are examining that issue uh, without necessarily prejudging it. I suspect that our position will stay the same as it did in 1997, um, because I think there's even more of an outcry now in New York State. And this is an opportunity for New Yorkers to take control of their government. Right. If we can get average New Yorkers elected to the constitutional convention, That's which the is the big question. Uh, but we're working on that. We we're should working. not. We should not. Groups are working on. Yeah, we should not back away from the fear of something. Right. But take this opportunity and change state government because we can deal with campaign finance. We can deal with election administration. There are a lot of things out there that we can deal with in a state constitutional convention. That this is an opportunity, and we should not let it pass. If we do, you know, we have yeah, nothing to complain about. That really warrants another uh, discussion. And we're planning to have one uh, in the coming year on the Constitutional Convention. Also on other issues, you, you mentioned uh, uh, referendums and initiatives, you know, initiatives and referendums and recalls. 
uh, elections as tools for reform, for example, which we do not have in New York State, Correct. As, as opposed to other states that have initiatives and recalls. So there's tools to be put in the toolkit uh, that we don't have. Yeah. And, and certainly the Constitutional Convention is one that we at the Institute, along with our partners in the reform organizations, will be looking at. So I think, yes, Mark. Just wondering if you think that if Silver and Skelos are convicted, it could be a watershed moment for reform in Albany, the way Watergate was 40 years ago in reform around the country and in Washington, or whether you think the legislature will just pay lip service to it and move on business as usual. That's one of the reasons why we had a press conference today. We believe that this is the tipping point. Um, we think that uh, there's really a crescendo uh, moment in this building. I think that um, voters, as they see more and more details, are moving from disgust to anger, and they want to see a change. And we've got a very specific agenda of what to be done, so we're not just saying, oh, make it better. This is what you need to do, and we all need to hold them accountable. Mark, I only hope so. I mean, you know, in these two trials, you know, we had the uh, Center for Public Integrity Index out earlier this week in which New York got a D minus for integrity and ethics. Uh, and then we had our own ethics review commission uh, that pointed the way for further reforms to JCO. Um, you know, we've got a governor who ostensibly committed to reforms but blames the legislature for not acting on them. I hope it does become a watershed moment in our state like Watergate was nationally. And, and just to put it into this, so, I mean, this, um, the students are really saying thank you both for this. Yeah, thank you. Um, so think about this, okay? We have a failing school system in the state, particularly in, in areas that are distressed, lower than 50% graduation rates in high school in distressed areas, with growing inequality and building up depression. Um, we have disenfranchisement all over the state, and we have political corruption. So you're paying heavily for a government that doesn't work in a state that has no control over, very little control over government corruption. That's the point that's going to be made here. Because I know my students are very interested in changing the world around them. And particularly a lot of them work in civic engagement work in communities around here. And this is all linked together in a way that has to be seen. So thank you. Thank you all for that. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And, I, and I do have, if people want to take, yeah, we have some propaganda. Can you just take one and pass it out? I'll pass it out. If you're interested, you can sign up.